mean, ethereal mirror is kind of a very different to forest in many respects because it's it's not such a extreme album. It's more of a more of a classic metal sounding record. And but what people it's like the whole thing we were saying when people were shouting faster, faster at the early cathedral gigs. Yeah. People couldn't get their head around the fact that we got they got their head around forest and then we go and throw another curveball by doing Ethereum Mirror. And they couldn't people who just about got their head around the slowness of the first album couldn't understand why we did an album like that. But I think that the starting point with that I think the more significant point would be the self sacrifice EP. Yeah. That's when we really changed. And the Ethereum Mirror was a continuation of that really, so I mean, I was always against it, to be honest with you. I just wanted us to play slow. And I remember, like, riffs to Autumn Twilight and stuff, I wasn't convinced by it. I, I remember we were sitting in a pub saying, I don't want to record this, it's too bouncy or something. Too jolly. I didn't want to do it. I was like, why can't we write any more slow songs? And it was like, what's the, the slow song off Soul Sacrifice? Frozen Rapture. Frozen Rapture. Yeah. I, like, I wanted it all to be like that. But then when we actually got in the studio and recorded it... <laughs> we don't it, say that anymore. I do actually. actually. <laughs> he does. He, he says it every <laughs> album. Can we do a song like Frozen Rapture? <laughs> Musically, I think we just uh, progressed. I think quite rapidly at some for some strange reason. I don't Which know why. Well, we'd I was on part of that album, yeah. but it's only because you've been touring a hell of a lot. Yeah, we'd, lot, we'd been uh, touring. We were used to what each other were doing. We were more comfortable with each other. Yeah, if you think about the transfer, transition from the first demo, say in memoriam, to Ethereal Mirror, which is only about three years, the musicianship became very, very strong and like. It kind of scared me in a way, to be honest. We were, do, we were in a situation where we did the Soul Sacrifice EP, which a lot of people say the contrast from the, the first album to the second one is quite extreme. But I think a lot of people miss the point that. Yeah, it's, it's not if you take Soul Sacrifice into account. It's a sim exactly. natural, it's a natural progression from Soul Sacrifice. Step. And also, I guess in those days, it was all relatively new to us what we were doing and we just, I guess, wanted to push ourselves and see where we could go. There was no specific agenda. Apart from like Gaz and Adam got better as guitar players and um, better at songwriting and stuff as well. So, so Ethereal Mirror was like a stronger sounding album, even though I must say the actual recording process wasn't very pleasurable. <laughs> I remember um, when we did the Soul Sacrifice EP, Columbia wanted to sign us, and they did the Columbia did a whole um, episode of signing, the, the, working with bands on earache, and we were the first band that they wanted to work with, yeah. and we had our deal was different to the rest of the licensing deal that they had with earache later on, and I remember you know growing up being despising major record companies really and being in a situation where a major record label like the biggest major label in the fucking world probably Sony Columbia want to sign your band it didn't seem right but I thought well let's just go with it and see what happens Well, the thing is, it came our way, mm. and um, I thought, well, if they want to waste a load of money on us, we're going to go and tour the States and have a good crack and see what happens, really. But we didn't form the band no. to be a band on a major label as a career move. Yeah. It just kind of came our way. So the fact that it all went tits up and we got dropped was like no big surprise, because we kind of willed that upon ourselves anyway. Because well, we dropped up, we dropped the whole roster, really, like, didn't we? Anyway? They did, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think about when it initially happened, yeah. They did, they released the Soul Sacrifice EP, didn't they, on Columbia? Okay. And, um, and then... They wanted to do change, change things themselves, didn't they, from what I remember? Some specific thing that they were trying to change? I can't remember. All I remember is we didn't... You'd unfortunately left the group. And we did uh, tours in Israel, and we did a tour with Trouble in St. Vitus, and we were doing a couple of new songs. We did Ride and Midnight Mountain on those gigs. Yeah. And, uh, and then 
we were booked in the studio in January and this was like December and we had, I, I, lyrically I had fucking nothing written. We did some demos earlier on and we didn't use any of the tracks except Midnight Mountain. Yeah, we didn't we? And There's like four, four tracks and yeah. we're scrapping them and starting again yeah. and scrapping and recording those demos in Clive's studio. And the eight track down the road. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I didn't know what was going on. The music was so advanced to me. All I, all I could really relate to was like primitive sounding stuff that was easy to write. And lyrically, I was having a real struggle to come up with ideas that matched the music, really. And I remember Earache sent me off to, uh, well, Columbia sent me off. <laughs> you went off to a cottage in the middle of nowhere. We're like Penzance. Yeah. We're like 500 quid spending money in a fucking cottage next door to a pub. So I, <laughs> I really wrote a lot of lyrics there. That was like a week before, two weeks before the studio. I just went and got absolutely pissed and walked along the beach at night with a dictaphone trying to come up with ideas, like looking at the moon, trying to get some, <laughs> trying to get some inspiration. <laughs> the lunacy. And then, yeah. yeah, the lunacy, exactly. Yeah. And then there was, oh, I had some pretty weird supernatural experiences there, let alone the ones we had in the studio. Didn't you end up thinking when you were in the studio you had some experience in the evening where you thought there was a, like, a portal to another dimension in your bedroom? Well, there was a ghost in my bedroom. <laughs> there was a ghost in my bedroom. Uh, I think that was, that's a different story, but I remember you <laughs> bastards winding me up that <laughs> fucking pillar on the staircase. <laughs> I thought a ghost had just pulled it off and threw it at me, and it was like, it, well, you, 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 I can't remember what it was, but it freaked me out. <laughs> I started reading, reading loads of esoteric literature. I thought, oh, I th because I, again, going back to Nigel Fellows, for instance, that's when we started hearing a lot of the psychedelic progressive rock groups that we hadn't really heard before. And I think Ethereal Mirror was more leaning towards that kind of underground progressive psych kind of angle mm -hmm. than the first album was. And I think those influences came more to the front on that record. And, um, so therefore, I, I, as much as I was still into the kind of reality aspects of lyrics, I wanted them to be a bit more, less obvious and a bit more psychedelic or something. So I was like torturing myself by smoking loads of weed and reading books by Leila Wendell about death and like the angel of death and stuff like this. And then reading magic books and having all these weird supernatural experiences to try and make the record more kind of vague and tripped out or something, I don't know, even though there was kind of a message behind it all. But, um, when, yeah, when we were in the studio, these guys started playing pranks on me. And I was actually quite scared. This is before I met Paul Chain. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we had such a shit time in the studio. It's the most luxurious <laughs> studio in the world. It was like, uh, it's where Sex Pistols did Never Mind the Bollocks, and I, that alone in itself was like, I was so born again. again. I was so psyched about that. We're talking to the groundsman from uh, the studio who was yeah. there when Pistols did the album, and he was on about Paul Cook or someone throwing a TV into the swimming pool or something. I was just like, ah, man, this is amazing. And we were in the same studio that Never Mind the Bollocks is recording. But then it got to the stage where the recording got a bit shitty really. The recording got in the way, didn't it? <laughs> well, it was great, we had it was like three course meals, like vegan yeah. meals that were like totally deluxe and Swim stuff like that. Swimming pool, snooker table. Graveyard out the like, back. Yeah. Not that that's really exciting. Really <laughs> 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 For a bit of, uh, bit of night time action. <laughs> and, uh, oh dear. And then the producer kind of got a bit heavy on us and he started saying yeah. things. I mean, he was doing his job and he did a good job, I think, but at the time, we were so used to recording it lo-fi and working with, not that Steve's lo-fi, but you know. <laughs> 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 we were so used to recording it in an underground way, that all of a sudden you're in this massive studio and it's for a major label. It looked, it seems really daunting. I didn't, I didn't like it really. And um, I remember we did some demos at Clive's place and the guitar sound was really raw and really like, yeah, shit, but remember, but great. Yeah. shit guitar sound but great guitar sound yeah. you know if you know what I mean and then all of a sudden we got this real clear tone on the guitar and like Adam's leads are cutting through like really sharp and really nice really yeah. beautiful sounding but it sounded like it was too much like pop 
or something. We weren't it, used to someone like coming in and tearing our songs apart and saying, don't play that, play this instead, and I don't, don't bend that note there because you're bending it too far. And it's like, well, that's what Doom's about. It's like, well, no, you, you don't want to be doing that. And it's like, Seth, I remember we, we, had, yeah. we had a little go through with him about the, the start of Phantasmagoria. I remember that, yeah. We went to the whole section out, yeah. 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 And he said, and we, we basically said to him, look, no, we've, we've compromised on some things, but this has got to stay. We've got to have this. <laughs> I remember him though, uh, yeah. he was like, oh, you want to turn it down or not? She's like, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> you, did, you fucking turned it up. You're telling him you turn it down. You had a fight with him, didn't I you? Didn't angry, right? Oh, God. Well, a few others did, did the bass. You know, when you recording the bass guitar? He's the good yeah. Gaz played all the bass on that record, didn't you? Yeah. See, these are all things... Oh, did he say something like Mick Jagger's bass player won't play it like that, didn't he? Something like that, You fucking bloody answer. Throw it out I can't remember something like that. Uh, Tom Reed mm. Poison's guitar player were better than me. What a cocksucker. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what a fucking knock. I had gone away for a bit and came back and I heard your solos and I thought, they're fucking spot on and he said you were shit. He it's said you were shit, didn't he? Uh, they probably are shit, but you know. But they're better than mine, I can tell you that. They were right. They were good. They were good. They were good. Time. Please, please cut out what a wanker, because yeah. he, he produced the record, he <laughs> might get the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> focus was the wheel wasn't it I think initially yeah it was I mean, it, circular motion of life or whatever yeah. cruelty of religion again uh, medieval cruelty it is a little bit more abstract than the first one I think the idea mm. and I think cathedral might be sort of riding roughshod through all this madness well the initial title was ride through the decay if I remember rightly yeah. I think that's the initial title they gave you. I think we changed the title literally about two days before the album got printed. And at this time, I, everything was coming from my imagination. These drawings were coming purely... I, may, I had a thing about not using uh, any imagery except what came from my own head. Mm -hmm. So there's this very naive quality in the, in the drawing because um, if you just draw from your head, it's amazingly difficult to do. And what comes out is a very stylistic naive type of drawing. That's what comes out of me anyway. As well on this one, we didn't want a photograph of the band on the back, even though there is on the CD, but on the record we just wanted to incorporate the band into the actual painting, right, as you see on there. Because that was more like a... I don't know, it's something that groups weren't doing anymore. We wanted to be part of the painting as opposed to be some like posed photograph on the back. Yeah, and there was a big <coughs> kerfuffle because one of the group left. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> turned into the Grim Reaper. <laughs> yeah, so I had, to, I had to take away his face <laughs> and turn him into a Grim Reaper. Really? Yeah, it was Grim. Yeah. Really? Originally he had red hair and a beard. <laughs> oh, the, the... Oops. You've even rubbed him out of the drawing, haven't you? I haven't. <laughs> you, you must have done that. How does Griff feel about that, being turned into the Grim Reaper? I don't yeah, know if he knew, knows, actually. The thing was, that, again, the artwork was done before the record was recorded, so... And Griff left, yeah, he left twice when on the American tour, just prior to the album being recorded, so... Gaz played bass on all of the albums, so... I didn't, we didn't know what to do, I mean, we couldn't just, like, take the figure off totally, so... We, that was the only... I think you came up with that idea, actually. Uh, I actually travelled all the way to uh, Nottingham, wasn't it? That was on the first I travelled to Nottingham in order because the painting was in Nottingham. Oh, you painted it all over I there? Paint, yeah, with a little bag of art material. Um, oh. I painted it... In their office, in the Earache At the Earache offices, yeah. Really? Yeah, it took me a day to, to paint it. And religion is very guilty of trying to smash the feminine. Uh, trying to blame, basically to blame an Eve for, for all sin. Uh, which, of course, is is nonsense so we've made religion rotten itself and the the apple itself is rotten it's full of uh, it's full of maggots this is punch here the chose. Mm. like you say synonymous with cruelty to children so you've got the cherubs that come in from the umbilical cord of the uh, dark angel whatever you'd want to call her or him mm. It's really saying that you know, 
human society will be rotten as long as religion has a hold. It's, it's going to be a struggle. At that time, I think we were all mates, you know. Griff had already left here, that was quite sad. And Adam decided he was going to leave, and that was really quite sad. I think the touring in America caused a lot of fret. It, it caused did. a it break. Just, it was just yeah, too it much. One, like, one minute we were all together, and we were all in it for the real... Like we were talking about the first hour, when it was like a real mission, and it was like really something we all wanted to do. And then all of a sudden you're in this situation where you're on a major label, and you've got all these demands, and we're doing tours we didn't want to do. And maybe we compromised ourselves musically a bit, <coughs> even though look, listening back to the album, it's quite a strong record. I wouldn't record. say, I, wouldn't, I probably used the, the wrong word when I said compromise, but... Well, I think we did, uh, in a way. I wouldn't say, I think in terms of production we did. At the time it felt like we were compromising because... I know, I know you definitely felt we were compromising. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't have a problem with the album. The, the, the songs are our, the music was our music, it wasn't like, put, you know, he never did anything that drastic. He, he rearranged a few things, yeah. but he never wrote any, I mean, all the music was written so by us anyway. So I like, thought it sounded great. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when it builds up to that chorus at the end of Grim Old Jury, I'm absolutely perfectly happy with that, it's brilliant. That's better than anything I could have done with it. Well, there's no denying that uh, Dave Bianca was a fantastic producer, but we just were not ready to work with someone like that. No. We were no. underground kids playing, doing, recording in shitty studios, all of a sudden you're in this like deluxe luxury place owned by Richard Branson, and you're doing a record for Columbia. And it's not what we were about, you know. You go to New York and they're doing all these photo shoots. They're trying to dress you up like the Black Crows. They bought those clothes, didn't they? Yeah. And you've got like you've got a wardrobe assistant at a fucking photo shoot. It's like, <laughs> well, you saw <laughs> pictures taken down the fucking cathedral in Coventry uh, with a hangover, and they've got uh, like people doing makeup, production, shit. It's photographs. Oh, and we got all the photographs. They cost, yeah. they cost ten thousand dollars these photograph sessions. We rejected every single one of them. We didn't even use them. I mean, that's more. I've never seen them. I don't think. That's more than I've got. I've got. <laughs> have you got them? It's horrendous. There might be a couple in there. We're the opening band on this bill. We didn't really want to be on, even though we're fans of Merciful Fate and stuff. We didn't really see that there's a right, it was the right tour for us, really. Every night, they'd have these things called meet and greets. Oh, God. And it'd be like a local radio station, the local rep from Colombia had set up a competition where the winners of this competition would come and meet Cathedral. It's like, if you want to fucking meet us, we'll be at the gig at the bar after we've played. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you don't need to come to a restaurant that's cost like four grand to come and say hello, because we'll be just walking around anyway. And. Um, it got really, really, really disillusioning. Basically, what would happen was people from the local record shops or the local Columbia people would come and have a load of food, drink a load of beer, and then fuck off home. They wouldn't even come to the gig anyway, which was literally next door around the corner. And we were just thinking, this is like a bloody soap opera. It's ridiculous. And I think our frustration got so far to the point where, yeah, we started like falling out with each other, which was really wrong. Um, and then there was like a divide in the band and then we yeah. actually started venting this in interviews, you know, you're on a major label in a, f a prime position to be potentially a successful act and in interviews we were saying we didn't like being on Columbia <laughs> in like major <laughs> magazines, we thought it was crap. <laughs> I mean that's the way we are, you know, we're not, we're not, we don't, it's not, you know, a lot of people might say it's a career plan and it's this and that. That was never our motive in the first place. <laughs> Ethereal two-piece. <laughs> yeah. Ethereal two-piece. Yeah. You wrote that on the, on the band, didn't you? No, so was that you? Actually, no. I don't think it was. I thought I'd love for you. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, there was such a divide in was, the band. I was, trying, I was trying to go from one to the other. What well, happened? It, 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 it Something happened. I don't know what happened to us on that last couple of tours. It was something to do with merchandise and publishing or something. It wasn't. No, I don't remember anything about merchandise or publishing. But something happened where the band got split in two. There were like you and Gaz on one side, and there were me and Mark on the other. And poor Scott sat in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah Scott. Yeah. Scott Carlson. Yeah. And you know there was all this kind of gabbing going on. We tore in a car and a band though. Okay. Yeah. We split off into a car. 
There was a car so, with yeah. us, wasn't there? And there was like, a van, Gaz was in the van. Oh, you yeah. were driving with Lowsby in that I went with Lowsby a couple of times yeah. on a couple of drives here. Yeah. We were in the car. We were in the car, tour. yeah. That was a fight tour. Yeah. But, you know. It was, a, it was horrendous. There was stupid stuff going on. That, I mean, Childish you know, stuff, funny when you think yeah, back. On, really. on all sides, no, nobody's innocent apart from Scott, like I said. Exactly. Yeah. But, it um, was really, it was really stupid. I would come from being so, so such a close knit group, all into the same things, and all of a sudden it was like being ripped apart. Yeah, and we like didn't, we didn't know why really. It's the hindsight thing, you know, if you could go back and do it again. Familiarity breeds contempt, doesn't it? You know, but I mean, we were both, we were all these both sides fighting at each other, when basically we should have been fighting against what was tearing us apart in the first place, which was the like situation. That. Going to get really nauseated well, by the well, no, I, I noticed this uh, this change in the band. They stopped wearing what they, uh, you know, their, their clothes, and suddenly this ragtag of sort. Seventies disco clothing <laughs> and hippie apparel starts. I mean, that's okay. I mean, I, look, I love a lot of like so-called hippie yeah. music, but not not the clothing. For God's sake, the, the, <laughs> the green stripes and the clouds to be up. I had a pair of green flares and one. I, 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 I remember coming down for rehearsal and they just had a massive big side. <laughs> <laughs> just denim, denim to the max, and I thought he was just messing about. <laughs> <laughs> my horror, he wasn't. But, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. God really. bless you. The thing is about all that. Oh, Paul, yeah. The thing yeah. is about all that. The, the the metal scene that we were kind of associated with was so uh. machismo and so. Everyone was frowning, and everyone was maybe, like. Yeah, maybe that was a bit of what was going on. Yeah. I think yeah, I, I, I thought. Against that. I don't know. Well, we're going on tour with like. Carcass and napalm around the states and stuff. People already hated the fact that I wasn't in the grindcore band, and there'd be kids in front row just like pointing their finger at me like that for the whole time, through the whole set. And I'm like, right, okay. <laughs> and then we, I think Gaz was he. he I, I had a pair of flares, <laughs> he coughed, but I think <laughs> somewhere in America he found his pair of lime green ones that were like this wide, made of pimple or something. <laughs> and he wore them just for a dust on stage this one night. Oh, I, th yeah. I remember thinking, this is fucking great, they hate, they hate us even more. <laughs> Let's get, I'll get a purple pair and you get a fucking... So he just started wearing his match yeah. 70s clothes, just as, as, as an in-joke in a way. I tried to blend into the amp even more then. <laughs> <laughs> it's black, I can dive in. <laughs> but the reaction he got was quite incredible, really. Yeah. And I remember that later on, after that, a couple of years after that, when, well, when we talked with Fight, I started going really over the top and wearing like red, really tight 20 inch waist, <laughs> massive flares, and like <laughs> silk shirts and stuff like that. And the reason for that was I hated that environment. I hated these fucking guys who were just like wearing vests and just they were so fucking macho and so negative and narrow minded. I wanted to fuck with their head, and like, you know, I'd be halfway through a song and someone would shout out, "Fuck off, you faggot!" Like, and I'd say, "Well, come here, big boy. I'm all ready for you. Come and suck my cock or something like that." And then they'd start fucking fighting, and you know, maybe these are things that should be on the DVD, but. <laughs> Uh, okay. <coughs> Stop but then, but uh, no, actually, carrying on with that point, it, it did get uh, to the stage where that whole image thing, people talked about that more than they did our music after a while. Well, there was this thing, didn't people start saying disco doom? Disco doom, yeah. yeah. Well, me and Steve Gurney used to go to <laughs> underground disco clubs in the late 80s. Because <laughs> we didn't want to go to rock clubs. Yeah. Uh. Disco well, yeah, all right. Well, what happened was, remember, we did Midnight Mountain, and we were like, which didn't help. No doubt. That was a reaction to the record company, actually. Well, it was, but I'm just saying it won't have helped to, in the disco. Do no, but there was one point. Remember, they were going to do a, a shaped picture disc of that T-shirt image of our that Dave did. Oh yeah. yeah. They were going to do a shaped picture disc, and it was going to be remixed by uh, Clinton. George Clinton. Clinton. Not George Clinton. Clinton. It was Bootsy Collins. Bootsy Collins Bootsy was going to do. It. To be fair to Lee though, I mean, he did like a, that Born Again thing, didn't he, the other thing? 
You're on again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean to be fair? <laughs> anyway, where were we before that mm. uh, devastating bit? We know that bit. We know that Yeah. Bootsy Collins was going to remix it, and he said he'd do it for five thousand dollars, which was really a good deal. Yeah. But I think what happened was the record company thought we were taking the piss and we kind of were but the idea of Bootsy Collins doing a remix to me was a great idea I'm a big fan of Parliament and Funkadelic and stuff personally but but then you realize all these years later you are actually crossing a line that could be conceived as taking a piss out of your audience really. <laughs> <laughs> so at the time it was like we kind of anything went in that in that respect and I think if, if Bootsy Collins would have done it, I'd be, I'd be dead chuffed, but it wouldn't have done the right thing. It would have alienated our audience more. And all of a sudden, we did this record that's like too heavy for the mainstream, but too commercial for the underground. And we ended up being in this like barren place in the middle that was non-specific and we didn't know where we were going and no one knew how to say what we were or think what we were about. And I think, like, um, that was quite a soul-destroying part of our time as a band, really. I remember the night, your last gig, it was at the Grand in New York, we were playing with Pentagram and stuff. It was Pentagram and 13, and everyone was like, oh, it's Adam's last gig, let's give him a good send-off. And you know what, that night I was really depressed. I couldn't say to you, really sorry to you're not in the band anymore. I was yeah, actually really upset. It might not have shown, but I was really upset. So I was, I well, you know, I was upset as well. I didn't. But well, people I throwing didn't, custard pies and everything. Yeah, like I, mean, I didn't take any. The custard pie thing was probably more to do with still in there. Really, to be honest, it's more of a, it's an old gaff from what we used right, to do right. in the old days. Probably. Did we have all the passports nicked. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, it was, that was really that bad was into the tour. And Lug lost all his photos, yeah. didn't he, yeah. with, with Rob Alford and that? Mm. <laughs> but no, no. I mean, Thanks, old Rob and stuff, yeah. I would have liked to have had a word with you both before I left, but I don't know. It's just no, you did. You came into the hotel when we got kicked off the Merciful Fate tour <coughs> and said, oh, I'm going to leave. So. Well, no, I, I don't think I was that blunt. I think we had, we had a, me and you had a conversation, because I was trying, I kept trying to tell you, I was trying to have a conversation with you about it. But every time I managed to get you on your own, Matt could come in mm. right, and, and it'd be like, oh, well, I don't want to say anything now because, you know, I just want to get the guy on his own and, and tell him what I'm, what I'm thinking. It was a horrible stage. Uh, yeah, and I think I had a, conversation, <coughs> a couple of conversations with Gaz about it. And, you know, I didn't want to leave. I didn't take any pleasure in leaving, but I just got to the point where I felt yeah, some, enough. something had to change. And I couldn't see any other way of changing it than, than other than me mm. going. No, I understand it now. It's just at the time it was like there was all this yeah, like yeah. animosity that was really didn't make any sense whatsoever going on and. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you never start a band to. Uh, lose members do you? he just things just happen along the way and unfortunately that's what happened with us within within three years you know two of the uh, original members had gone so uh, yeah it was, it was bleak in it you know you don't there's no good time for anyone to leave a band really i suppose it's quite sad when someone does I don't, you don't really appreciate uh, sometimes you don't really appreciate members of bands until until they go yeah, until they've gone and then realise the importance Speak of for yourself. You know, it's just like uh, you appreciate them later on, I think, more than you do when you're actually in the band at the time. We couldn't find members to save our lives really. Like you say, we had hired hands from other bands and stuff. We didn't really try to find members really from the UK. And we spent two years just in the wilderness. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Money, money was something that 
it helps to record an album, doesn't it? It's yeah. Pay for yeah. recording. Probably lack of money is what drove us to be more serious about what we were doing, really, because our situations were so fucked up individually. We didn't have a pot to piss in between us, really. We had a pot noodle for piss <laughs> And take the peas out of <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that's what we used to live on, pot noodles and uh, white bread. We used to get, like, a pot noodle and a six-pack of really cheap beer or something, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, R Randy Raunchy Ravers and uh, yeah. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a dog's buggy for an electronics firm. I'm an overblown office junior who is paid an extremely small amount of money. Uh, well, you're a singer in cathedral, aren't you? Oh, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, still in Cathedral, obviously, but I own a record label that I've been there for 20 years. <laughs> but I couldn't say I couldn't say it's a job, even though it is a full-time job. It it's something I love with a passion and really enjoy doing. But in terms of an income, it's not really an income because there is no kind of wage or anything like that. But I do do it full-time, five, six, seven days a week, most of the time, really. But I get such a buzz out of that means it's your job, mate. It's my job, but I don't get a wage, so... <laughs> um, I, I love that. <coughs> Hopefully I'll be able to do it for a long time. I've already been doing it for 20 years, so I get really excited about hearing new bands that I like and going for the whole process of them recording a the record and, and putting it out. It's fantastic. Apart from that, I have no more bad habits, really. Occasionally, I have a beer. Occasionally. <laughs> Listen to Motown and Saxon and <laughs> I collect really expensive psychedelic records and yeah, that's about it really. Saxon, Merlion, Saxon. You're on the hockey? Uh, I'm an office worker for money, that's it. <laughs> nothing nothing uh, very exciting to write home about. I haven't done any music really apart from my own creations at home, just a hobby musician these days. That's about it really. You're a father? I'm, of course, I'm a father to two lovely kids, but... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a full time job. Um, yeah, I, just still, I still play Cathedral and uh, I'm a part owner of a major retail firm. <laughs> oh, I, am. <laughs> I am, actually. You got a share? Have you got a sale on? Uh, have you got a sale on? <laughs> Can I get your shop fittings? <laughs> yeah, and that's it, basically, yeah. Oh, I can't say, I can't mention the name, can I? Because I get into trouble. You, well, so you, this is not for the BBC, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Just the address. Face it. Just the address, yeah. No, I just work in retail. Shrug his shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> About 1992, walking from my flat in Hillfields into town for a pint somewhere. And we're like, ah, oh, yeah. Well, it's been good, but I don't think it's going to last much longer, is it? Maybe give it give it a year or two, and then it's all going to be over. Um, but we didn't expect no way to be here all these years later. Absolutely no way. It's almost 20 years. So. Depends how you do, how you. Uh measure success because I think uh, to us we've succeeded in everything that we've wanted to do because the fact that we've myself I've jammed you know with, I got up and did a sound check with Trouble and stuff like that we've had like Iomi play with us we've toured with Sabbath uh, you know we did things with Bytus um, met people from Witch Finder General stuff like that met Angel Witch I think the main drive is the sheer love of the music and everything that it's about. And, um, like Gaz just rightly said, you know, meeting people that you're inspired by and becoming friends of theirs, to me, it means more than selling a few extra copies of a record. Mm. Yeah, of course, I miss it. Creating music within a band, but on the other side, a band with Cathedral. Yeah, see. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the other side, at the time, I had to leave. I had to get out of that situation. 
for all there was to it. I mean, I miss you being in the band. Lots of time, I'd love to be back doing the band and so on and so forth, but times and situations change and, you know. I, I think with, with Griff, like, the one thing I miss about Griff was his uh, vision. And, like, lyrically, we could share ideas and stuff. Now I'm, like, by myself yeah. in that respect. And I think between us, we had a real good dynamic, writing lyrics and stuff. So now it's a bit harder for me, really, because well, I... I can get, still give you some lyrics if you want. Yeah, you can <laughs> find <laughs> If you could, if we could bring the 1993 Adam in here, he'd have other things to say. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I'm honest, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I probably do regret leaving Cathedral. Um, I don't regret my life since leaving Cathedral. If I hope that doesn't sound like a contradiction. No, no, no. Um, exactly. What, that's right. Things have happened to me since leaving Cathedral that have been wonderful. If it's um, happened for a reason, isn't it? So. Yeah, but on the other hand, I, I would be lying if I said I didn't regret it. Does that mean you miss uh, it or...? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I probably, to be honest, I probably miss you two more than oh, touring. I hate one of myself. <laughs> <laughs> the friendship and so on, come out to... Touring or yeah, uh, recording or something, but yeah, yeah. We, we, we used to have a good laugh. Uh, so, you know, probably miss that a little bit. I think it's, to be honest, I think it's a case, the grass is always greener on, you know, yeah, on whatever course, side, yeah. and, you know, it's all very well to bullshit and say, well, yeah. <coughs> we did have a good crack, though, whenever we were together in Cov, going out in the town. Yeah, and I mean, I, I used to come down and fucking stay, even when we weren't doing anything, didn't I? We used to go out, even though we didn't have any bloody money to go out, no. we used to go out and, like, have five quids worth of beer and then go back to the house and watch Rising Down. Watch Rising Down. What is it? It's a. Uh, it's, it's, it's a feeling of power, isn't it? It's a feeling of power, uh, rain soaked depression, the, you know, when you're feeling down, that's doom. Doom's it's unexplainable, heavy. really. It's. It's unexplainable, you can't put it in a nutshell. I mean, I don't, the cathedral's not really doom in the, in the essence of it anymore so much, but. Uh, doom is <coughs> the end. Mm. The end. Photographing James Cock on your phone. Yeah, yeah, taking it home. But that, would, I mean, it's a metal statue and it's Satan's Cock. That must be one of the most metal things I've ever seen. <laughs> I can't believe I never noticed it before. Really. I wouldn't have even known it was there unless you told me. Um, show me your face of metal. I don't have a face of metal. Go on, show me your face of metal. No, face of doom. What's the face, face of doom look like? Face of doom. look like that. Probably going to arise in about 10 minutes. Come on, I need a face of doom. <laughs> Face of, face, face, of face of doom, goes That's not the face of doom. That's a face of doom. Come on, give us some kind of crazy... <laughs> give us a growl of metal. <laughs> that, no, <laughs> you can't say not metal. You weren't growling. You're like a homosexual nice boy band or something. <laughs> oh, it's fighting time. <laughs>